Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, my guest today is a brother from separate mothers. <laughs> and his name is John Sanchez. And the reason why I say that is our paths have not crossed until earlier this year, but we do a lot of the same type of communication work in the accounting and finance arena. And we're I, I look, I'm looking at him right now. We're identical twins. I mean, he might be a little bit taller than I am, but you know, he's, he's, he's a good looking guy. I mean, I'm just saying, uh, but I'm, I, I will say that, you know, I, I've heard of his name. He, you know, he said, Marguerite is not too hard to forget. So he's got a drinking problem, I guess, but, uh, <laughs> but he, he, he stalked me, as he said, I was interviewed on his podcast and he stalked me on LinkedIn and, um, a 30 minute conversation, initial conversation I had with John turned into be an hour. And that's always a good sign. So first and foremost, John, <laughs> thank you for putting up with my humor and taking time out to uh, be a guest on my podcast. Well, thanks for having me on the podcast, my brother from another mother. <laughs> and and just, just for your audience, I was the one that used the term stock. Um, you just kept, you kept popping up in all the, the same places, uh, clients that I was working with, or or <laughs> conferences, or you know things like that. Um, and and so I just so I don't forget. Can you tell everybody the name of your podcast? My podcast is called On Ramp to Success, which I do with a couple of partners in crime, who are also fellow trainers, and it's we we focus on mostly on on self improvement topics. Cool. That's a short answer. That's a short answer. And it's on um, Apple Podcasts and other uh, podcast platforms? Yeah, all, yeah, all the big ones. So we're on YouTube. We, we typically do a video. Mm -hmm. So those are on YouTube. And then uh, I know we're on, we're pushing out to all the big ones. So Apple Podcasts, um, the Google Play, mm. Spotify, Stitcher, and a couple of other ones. Okay. Um, so, you can find all the links and everything though on onramptosuccess.com. Um, right. That's just devoted to that that podcast. Cool. And, and and I had a good time on your podcast. You're 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 a very good host. You didn't beat up on me or tell bad jokes like I just kind of told bad jokes about, about you. So <laughs> all my jokes are dad jokes. <laughs> dad jokes. And we're coming either, up to Father's Day. <laughs> they're either dad jokes or inappropriate. So I'll, I'll keep <laughs> keep them to the dad jokes. <laughs> So my, my question is to you, you graduated from Florida State University with a Bachelor of Science in Accounting. Go Knowles, yes. And in looking at your background, I, I see trainer, uh, content strategist, subject matter expert, and uh, industrial design, institutional design. Um, and then we get to the communication consultant, trainer, coach, the FPA group, which is your organization, which is your company. And I, it's weird for me to ask this question, but that's not a typical path for, for anybody who's coming out with an accounting degree. I, and yeah. I, now, the other question is, did you wake up one day and say, I want to be an accountant, or did you just happen to find your way into the profession? Uh, actually, the way I came to pursue accounting was it was it was a couple of things one of which was process of elimination but the other one was I looked at college like <laughs> excuse me my parents when I was a kid always talked to me about college as a must and my perception of college was you go to college so that you can have a career that has stability longevity that pays well and has good benefits right and I think their model of the world back in their generation, that worked perfectly. And to give you context, my dad was in the army for 30 years. When he retired from the army, he worked for the state of Florida for 10 years and retired from there. My mother worked for civil service for 28 years. So that model of work for a big company like the army, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Just work hard and, and you retire there and, and life goes well. So when I started looking at different types of careers, I thought, Everybody needs accountants. It doesn't matter if it's a big company or a small company. It doesn't matter where the, the business is, or even if it's a nonprofit, all over the world, they need accountants. 
size of the company, none of that stuff matters. Everybody needs accountants. Mm -hmm. And when I started at FSU, the accounting program there had an, a 90 plus percent placement rate. So I had no idea what I wanted to major in. And I thought, if my only purpose is to get a degree that's going to make getting a good job easier, this seems like a good path. And, and it did. It checked, it checked all the boxes in those regards. Yeah. But you're an entrepreneur now. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's the scary world, right? Yeah. So I, I became an entrepreneur to, to, to go back to another commonality we have. So you're the accidental accountant. Right. I was sort. I sort of became accidentally not an accountant. Um, <laughs> so I became an entrepreneur against my will. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I actually first started working for myself in '97. I was working at AutoNation, and I was a manager of corporate development, which probably means nothing to most people. Basically, what it meant was I jockeyed a gigantic set of spreadsheets that encompassed the five-year strategic plan for the used car division of AutoNation. So think CarMax, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's what's that, what that division was back then. Um, CarMax did exist back then, but they were a startup just like we were. And to make a very long story short, about a year after I started that job, they shut down the whole business unit. Um, and myself and 400 and some other people got laid off all at once. And I was like, oh, what in the world? Like, I've never been laid off before. And luckily, because of the nature of my job, I was having an interface with people from all over the company. I got a call back from one of the controllers, one of the division controllers, and they hired me back to be a consultant. And so I did that for about a year-ish. And that was kind of my start working for myself. And I kind of thought, this is pretty cool. I'm making more money as a contractor working for them than I was as an employee. For me, the work was easy on that project. And I had tons of, of control of my time. And I was still able to go out and do other things if I wanted to, which I did, other consulting work. Um, so that I kind of backed into entrepreneurship, if you will. But you're an accountant. What are you doing after teaching other accountants how to communicate? Because accountants don't communicate well, right? Yeah, we're not supposed to do that, right? Right. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. I joke with people that I used to get in trouble in school for talking too much. And so somehow or another, I figured out a way to get paid to talk. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it actually, that also happened by accident. So I was doing, so after I finished that work for AutoNation, that was all like financial consulting work. Mm -hmm. And so I just started doing that for other companies. And in, I think it was 2011, Someone through LinkedIn uh, just sent me a message on LinkedIn and said, hey, uh, we were just looking at your background and we do these conferences all over the country. We have one that's focused on budgeting and forecasting. Would you be interested in speaking at the conference? And I'd never done it before, but I thought this sounds interesting. Tell me more. And so I ended up doing that one. It went well and I did a bunch more for them. And I started thinking, see, you actually pay me just to talk to people, yeah. like just get up in front of people and talk about stuff that I know. So I thought, what if I actually pursued this as opposed to just, you know, if and when it, it came to me, I would do it. And so over time between 2011 and, and I'd say probably a couple of years ago, I started shifting to doing more speaking and training and less financial consulting work. Mm -hmm. And probably a couple of years ago, I would say I, I was pretty much just focused on developing and delivering training. Um, and the communication focus came from, I, I guess the best way to say it is by my own weaknesses. Um, when I was working at AutoNation, somebody very directly told me that my communication skills sucked. And they gave me very concrete, specific examples of times that they'd said hello to me and I didn't even say anything back. And uh, I didn't make eye contact and all these things, which I thought for sure they had too much to drink because they told me this at a happy hour. <laughs> and then the next day in the office, I went to some of the guys I worked with very closely every day. I said, wait a minute. They said this, this, and that. That's not true, is it? They went, uh, yeah. Like, what? So I started to realize like I had no awareness 
that I was doing these things. I was just so wrapped up in work. I just, I just was not aware at all. Um, and so over the course of years, I just started reading and going to seminars and listening to books on tape and doing everything that I could find to get better at communication and some other things too, but communication was my focus in the beginning because it was such a big weakness. And then as I started speaking at these conferences, it started out as technical topics, right. budgeting, forecasting, right, things right. like that. Yeah. And I started looking at, I'd be at a conference that was like two or three days, like all day training in, in various different topics. And I started realizing there's nobody talking about communication skills. And it's the number one skill that people complain about the most with accounting and finance people. Right. So I came up with like an hour program to propose. And at first it met with a lot of resistance, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you can believe it because of what you do. Mm -hmm. um, but I was shocked at how resistant people were at first. And it's interesting that when COVID hit, that completely turned around. And there, I have a lot more people asking me about communication skills and, and related topics like emotional intelligence and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, so that, that's kind of how I got to, to that as a specialty. Yeah, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a long haul because I, I remember I was doing a lot of technical topics. I would, I would put out a, a, a communication topic and five people show up. I do a revenue rack, I got a full house. But somewhere around 2015, 16, I believe, that I started seeing this shift. I started doing less technical and more communication. And I think by 2018, I quit doing the technical accounting and focused all on the communication aspect of it. And still to this day, I still run into accountants and they some still don't get it and i went with technology it, the numbers are being crunched for you you've got to be able to communicate yes. the numbers and if you don't do something about that you're going to be unemployed it's getting even worse too with artificial intelligence and rpa robotic process mm -hmm. automation that's starting to automate even the things that used to be our world the example i give all the time is my cell phone bill. Um, back when I worked at Royal Caribbean Cruises and I was a financial analyst, one of the things we did every single month is we would do a budget to actual comparison and do a variance analysis and explain right. the variances, right? Basic financial analyst 101 stuff. Well, we used to sit down with the financial statements and do that manually. Mm -hmm. And now my Verizon bill has that that's automated for me. I pull up my bill. And it shows all the differences between the, the last bill and the current bill, my usage, and all these different pieces of, of data that, that just gets spit out. And it's all automated on there. And they don't have some analyst sitting there doing that. So more and more of these processes are being automated. So the, the things that computers can't yet do very well are the things that are becoming more and more in demand and communicating well is one of those. Um, but still, to your point, I have a section in one of my classes where it's specifically about communicating financial information and other numbers. Mm -hmm. And the second I put a spreadsheet up, you would think I was throwing money at people. They perk up because that's my world. They, they feel comfortable again. Right. You've been talking about all these you know, communication issues that some of them feel like Gosh, I need a lot of work on that, but boy, I know me some spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get, you get pretty excited over a spreadsheet. Um, and, and I think, I, you know, I, I think part of the challenge is, you know, and I'll use this analogy. You don't become a leader because you go to a leadership seminar. You have, nope. to, you have to take baby steps and practice it every single day. And it's hard. You did the hard work. A lot of people won't do that hard work of, okay, I've got a communication issue. I've been told I have a communication problem. I'm going to go fix it and, and put in the, the hours, the days, the week in order to become a mastery of it. Well, I think for me, it was a couple of drivers of that. One was it made me feel very uncomfortable when somebody told me that because I thought I thought I was a likable person. I always, as a matter of fact, growing up, I feel like 
being a likable person was what kept me from bad stuff happening at the hands of bullies. Cause I was always just like the smallest kid in class, sometimes the smallest kid in the whole school, right? When I entered high school, I was four foot nine and a half and I wouldn't let you forget the half. <laughs> uh, so I was a little, I was a little guy and I didn't do like, you hear these stories about, I was bullied. So I started studying martial arts and I became a ninja black belt yeah. in 10 different things. Eh, I, I, I think my instinct was, be, be, and I probably learned it, if people are laughing, they're not going to hit you. They're not going to pick on you typically. So somebody would start picking on me and I would just make them laugh. And it's like, it just melted it away. Whatever that thing, because the bullying that I experienced was, was like opportunistic bullying. Oh, there's a little guy. I'm going to pick on him. Mm. Right. It wasn't like there wasn't anything in particular other than I was a little guy that made them yeah. want to pick on me. Yeah. But hey, wait a minute. He's funny. Maybe we should just. What else you got, kid? Yeah. <laughs> um, do you ever do, and, you ever do stand up? No, it's uh -huh. it's one of the things on my list of things I want to try because the idea of it, uh, I find it terrifying. Which means I probably have to do it at some point. Um, so. I've done stand up in my day. Um, and I don't, like I was sharing with you before, I don't memorize. I, I'm not. I, I, can, I can stand in front of an audience for an hour, two hours, eight hours, doesn't matter. I love it. I, I just get jazzed. Five minutes? Are you kidding me? I'm, I'm, I'm like to the point, I, and I finally have gotten past that. But there was one time I was supposed to be at this uh, open mic night, and I was sitting in my car coming up with every excuse possible why I shouldn't even go in there. I even called my son. Hey, you sure you don't want me to come and pick you up from ski club? Dad, just go do your stuff. I'll be okay. Uh, something about that five, ten minutes of memorization just would paralyze me. Yeah, I, I, I've always been perfectly fine talking. But to your point, when it has to be focused and concise, I don't think anyone who's, who's never tried to be focused and concise consistently, I don't think they can appreciate how hard that is. Mm. Um, and that expression, what is it? Uh, uh, good writing, or good reading is damn hard writing, I think is the, the quote. Um, and it's, it's so true. I mean, I, what was it you said earlier? We scheduled a 30 minute call. We ended up talking for an hour, an hour and a half, yeah. whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. If you have the time, right. And, yeah. and you're having a good conversation, that's great. But in certain settings, not so good. No bueno. Right. <laughs> so I didn't know your friend. Just, just on my mother's side. <laughs> um, you like it, the fries, no? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's interesting that um, well, you should go. To, I, I, I will. I will say you should try stand up. It, it, there's a lot that there's a lot that I learned from stand up because you know, we we present to accounting and finance professionals. They don't really show any body language when we're up there. You could tell some, a, hum, a human story and you're getting crickets. That's what stand up taught me because I would tell a joke and get crickets. So, but now I know when I can, when I tell, uh, use a humorous story and it comes to, here comes the humorous part and nobody's laughing. I go, okay, I know, I know. You're just keeping it all in here. Well, that's what we do. We left brain accounting people, but you can't let it out every once in a while. Have you ever pondered though, the chicken and egg thing? Do, do a lot of people get into accounting because that suits their personality that they already have or once they get into accounting, does the culture of accounting kind of beat them into submission when it comes to certain types of showing emotion or enthusiasm? Because mm. I found a little bit of kind of like the nature nurture thing, yeah. which is it? Yes. I, I, it seems to me like it kind of some of both. What have you I found? Agree. I agree because uh, it, 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 I got beat up a lot over the head with a mallet. You talk too much, quit making jokes. Blah, 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 blah. conform get in line remember you walk out of this office you get on the elevator you better have your jacket on it, it, it was just this kind of and and but here's what i am finding there's a lot of us out there recovery accidental who are still in 
the practice of accounting, but they've come from backgrounds of, of, of theater, uh, of social workers. And sure. they've done because of what you started off with, it's a great paying job, it's steady, benefits that fiscally responsible piece. Uh, and a few of them said, it's like living a double life. Yeah, because, I could I could see how, that, yeah, how they could feel that way. And there are some who are there because they, I very, well, I, I've yet to find one person say, you know, when I was in when kindergarten, asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I said accountant. I don't think anybody's ever said that. Yeah, I. The only two things that I can remember wanting to be when I was a kid, was I thought I wanted to own my own business because. It, it always seemed like the rich people I would see on TV mm -hmm. had their own businesses. They were either some type of an artist, a singer, a, a actor, or some, something in the arts, right. or they were people running their own businesses. Uh, of course, I had no clue what the heck that meant to own or run your own business, but it sounded good. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the other one was a, a totally goofy sort of reason for wanting to be it but i i decided that i wanted to be an fbi agent and the <clears throat> here's why i say it's goofy reasoning behind it um is one day i was at the the bx the base exchange with yeah. my mom and they had this big book of like discount books and i'm walking through the books and my mom's a big reader she's you know knee deep picking out books and i'm looking around for something that seems remotely interesting and I see this one book, it's called Will. And I thought, Will, is that about a guy named Will or Will Power? What is that? I picked it up and I started reading the description. And it was the autobiography of G. Gordon Liddy. Yeah, for, I've read that. For, for those of you in the audience that, that don't know who he is or maybe a little younger than I am, um, G. Gordon Liddy was an FBI agent. He was, I believe he was the only one involved in the Watergate scandal who actually served time in prison. And my understanding of why he ended up serving time in prison is that he refused to talk. Lots of other people made deals with the government yeah. and got light sentences or whatever. And his, his autobiography in hindsight was really self-serving. It just made him sound like the biggest, badass, coolest, toughest guy in the world. Right. You know, he, he told all these stories about that made sound, it, it, being an FBI agent sounded like the coolest thing in the world. The beginning of the book, he talked about how he used to be afraid, scared to death of lightning and thunder. So one day when he was a little boy, he climbed up a tree and he tied himself to this tree in the middle of a thunderstorm. It sounds goofy, yeah. me describing it now, but I was probably 10 years old. And I was like, that dude is badass. <laughs> I want to do that. A gun and a badge. That, that was like, and interestingly enough, when I was at FSU as an accounting major, uh, Beta Alpha Psi always used to have like a recruiter happy hour and various big organizations would come in and they'd have a guest speaker. They'd talk to the group and then we would get to ask them questions and mingle and stuff. The FBI, Miami office, I, I grew up in South Florida. They, every year they would, they would have somebody come and speak. And the first time I heard them speak, they were talking about their white collar crime division. And they talked about how, if you're an accounting major, we highly recruit CPAs. So finish your degree, study for the exam, get your CPA. You, you know, there might be a place for you in the FBI. And I was like, oh, maybe the stars have aligned. I accidentally picked the right major. <laughs> and then like my last semester, they had a giant like federal hiring freeze. Yeah. So that was taken off the table, which in hindsight, thank goodness, now looking back, I can't, I don't think I've ever had the personality of someone to carry a badge and a gun. I, I just I don't think so. Anyway. That, that's funny because a couple of my students when I was teaching at the Ohio Dominican University that joke kills here in Columbus. Uh, I had two students who they were getting their accounting degree because they wanted to carry a gun and a badge. That was the sole intent. One wanted to go to the DEA. One wanted to go to the FBI. And when I would when I would talk to, uh, like you know, first year accounting students or the, the entry level to accounting force, I go, yeah, this is going to seem hard, seem difficult, 
But if you can get your accounting degree, it opens you up to a lot more than some of the other majors that are out there. And it's true. The, and yeah, so I, I, I did pass the exam because you know why? I'm a really good test taker, apparently. Uh, but I'm not a, practic a practicing accountant. And I probably should have never been a practicing accountant because there's way too much detail and digging into the numbers. I could see this from, from the top level. But then there's so many different opportunities out there with, within the auspice of an accounting degree that. Oh, it's ton. And to your point, you know, I, 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 I think this is still the same. I was having sophomores get internships at accounting firms and, and other places, and they were getting offers when they're in their junior year. Yeah, I got my offer about six months before I graduated. And I thought, I, I literally, I, I didn't dream about it, but I thought about it constantly. And most of the people that I hung around with um, in the accounting program had much better grades than I did. I was like a solid B student. Um, I had to sneak into the beta alpha psi, uh, <laughs> you know, mixers. Um, but my friends, my especially my my fraternity brothers, called me the schmoozmeister. Oh, nice! Because I, I knew with it, like a, a a B average, my grades alone were not going to get me a job at the big companies that I was gunning for. Um, and as it turns out, they did not. Um, I had interviews with all of the big six. It was the big six back then. And I had a Price Waterhouse partner tell me right there in the interview suite at FSU, picked up my resume, looked at it, and basically said, I'm paraphrasing, well, uh, we really don't have any place at Price Waterhouse for someone like you. But since we have the time, if you have any questions about the firm or the industry, I'd be happy to answer them. And I felt about this big. And luckily, the CPA firm I ended up working for, Kenneth Leventhal, they don't exist anymore. They were right. acquired by, by E&Y, um, I think in 94, 95, some, somewhere in there. Um, but they had a totally different focus. I mean, you had to have decent grades. They had to be average, but they were much more focused on stuff that was not on your resume. They looked at my resume very briefly, but the whole conversation was, they were trying to find out about me as a person. And I think the biggest thing they were trying to figure out is, is this, is, does this guy have a work ethic? And would I want to work with this guy because we work a lot of overtime, we work a lot. And we, we do a lot of out of town work. So I'm going to be around this person a lot if I hire him. Is this somebody yeah. I want to work with? Um, and it turned out everybody, in that firm that I met from staffers like myself all the way up to partners, they were grinders. They had a work ethic, like it's unbelievable work ethic, but they were all like more of a people person personality than, than any of the other firms that I interviewed with and even friends of mine that worked at some of the other firms. Um, it just felt totally different. I'd go meet a friend for lunch that worked at Arthur Anderson. Yeah, I'm old. <laughs> um, and this guy, mind you, this is in Miami, right? The Miami yeah. office of Arthur Anderson was in one of the high rises. And they had offices on multiple floors. And they were so, I'll use the word stuffy, that their rule was, if you left the office, you had to put your jacket on. So first of all, it's Miami. I don't care if it's December. It's like a thousand degrees with, 1500% humidity all the time in Miami. It's always hot, but you had to wear your full suit when you left the office. But guess what? Leaving the office even meant if you went to a different floor of Arthur Anderson, because to get on the elevators, you had to go into a common area. So they literally have to put on their, their coat jackets to go from floor to floor within the same building. That's how stuffy the, the culture was. Mm -hmm. And Kenneth Leventhal was like, nah, man, if you work hard, and you do a good job. And to, their idea of smart was the same as mine, which was, are you willing to learn and are you willing to put in the effort to learn? Because we can teach you all the technical crap. That's not an issue. We've got smart people and they can teach you all that. So as long as you can work hard and you're reasonably intelligent, I want someone that I want to work around. Yeah. So let me ask you this question. As we're talking, and I, 
I said something about internships and something popped into my, my brain and the work that you do currently, work that I do currently, I've always thought, well, what is your thought around eliminating the accounting internship as it stands today, where you go to the office and you do all the hokey pokey, you can put your whole self in versus creating an internship program where you're your potential hire has to spend a year or two during college in the service business at a restaurant in a hotel and, and, and have to interact with the public as um, Ron White would say, the public. <laughs> you must be referring to when he was thrown into public. <laughs> and, and we, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's it, who's thrown <laughs> into the public, exactly. And, and, and I never thought about this, but I was speaking at a conference and I was doing, you know, it was a tax conference and a guy comes up to me and he's been around for a while. He had more miles on, on him than we both do combined. But he said, and it's gruffly, like, I need to get rid of the internship program. Make these kids go out and work in, in, with the, in the service industry. Wait tables, be bartenders, learn people skills. None of them have any people skills. I went, that's the most brilliant idea ever. I had never thought of that. I've never heard anybody suggest that. But it immediately sounds like a great idea for a whole laundry list of reasons. The first of which is the obvious, the people skills. Yeah. But I think also the work ethic, like I was talking about, um, cause I can, I can remember accounting professors like talking about how, how hard the work, if you're going to work in public accounting, what in the program I was in, they, they focused a lot on public accounting because it, mm, yeah. it felt like public accounting was perceived as the top of the food chain. Right. And if you work mm. for the big six or the big eight before that big four cents, if you work for them, then the world is your oyster. Right. And it's true because I saw people that as a senior or a manager, which is, I mean, that's a, a mid, mid level supervisor to, to, you know, mid management role, they would routinely take jobs as controllers or a director of accounting at a pretty big company um, and leapfrog people who started in private accounting as a staff accountant working for a company. Or, doing fixed assets or journal entries all day long. Um, but they, all of our professors would tell us all the time about the, the work ethic and working long hours, but nothing about the other piece of it, the, the people side that you're talking about. Um, and as a matter of fact, and I'm curious what your experience was, um, I had never heard of a rubric until I had, I was probably six, seven, eight years out of college. And I, I thought I'd always been interested in psychology and I'd already kind of started taking a lot of these things on my own seminars and reading books and stuff. So I, I signed up for some psych classes thinking I might want to go back and get a master's in psych. And on day one of one of these classes, they gave us a rubric and I went, what is this? For those of you that don't know what a rubric is, it's your recipe, how to get an A. It tells you exactly how every everything in the course is going to be scored. And the recipe is, if you want an A, you need 93%. And this is how much every single thing that you're gonna do, the entire course is going to be graded. And the, the professor would literally, all right, we're gonna have a test on Friday. It's gonna be on, on the last four chapters we talked about. Open your books up to chapter, uh, to page 23. Uh, those two definitions on page 23, memorize those. Those are gonna be on the test. Okay, skip the next two pages. Nothing on there is going to be tested. Okay, on the next page, they'd literally go through and tell you what was going to be tested, right? In my accounting classes, here was, here was your brief on the, on the test. We're having a test on Friday. It's going to cover chapters one through four. Know everything. Okay, on to today's lesson. Right. Just know it all. Yeah. And, and the only explanation I was ever given that even made any sense was that in the real world, in accounting, in business in general, nobody gives you a decoder ring, right? You will be given lots of information, much of which is irrelevant, much of which you need to clean up before you can do anything with it. And you need to get good at problem solving and just figuring shit out. Mm -hmm. That's the only 
semblance of any kind of explanation I was ever given for why nobody ever enlightened us about what to study. And so that, that idea of giving someone a rubric, I thought, why didn't these jerks in the accounting program have this for us? Because I could have got an A, I'm willing to work for it, but sometimes it felt like it was just an overwhelming amount of information to master in the given time. Um, but anyway, I, yeah. I digress. Well, the, the, I mean, I, I got introduced to the rubric when I was when I was teaching because I had to start using it in the class. But uh, I would never go, okay, turn to page five, memorize this, do this. I'm, oh yeah, you're on your nice. own. You're on your own. I'm, I'm giving I'm giving you a little bit of a roadmap on how, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna walk you through it. Um, and, and I I think that those who those professors who are walking their students through it, I think they're looking for their evaluations to be better than the actual uh the event itself uh, well, you know they're, they're helping them yeah but this i find this interesting it's funny you say that because when i took mis management information systems i still to this day i can't remember her name but i remember the professor that taught the class she was she got her phd at university of tennessee and everyone thought she was a witch with a capital b mm -hmm. because she gave so much work she gave tons of homework and a lot of it was, was really hard stuff. But she gave us, she didn't call it a rubric, but in hindsight, she gave us a rubric. She told us exactly wh what we needed to do to get an A. She didn't do like I was describing with telling you exactly what was gonna be tested, but there was enough extra credit offered that if you botched a test or a quiz, there was enough extra credit that you could get an A if you were willing to put the work in. And I did, that was one of the first upper level accounting classes I, I got an A in. And everybody else was like in shock because I was not a straight A student. And I was like, dude, how could you not get an A? She tells you, you have all these opportunities. I didn't get an A on every test, but there's all that extra credit. They were like, that's, that's a lot of work, <laughs> but I want an A. Yeah. I, I, I didn't even go the MIS route, but I just, if you tell me how to get an A, well, shoot, I could do that. Yeah. If all I have to do is work for it, I, I could do that. But for some so, people, that that's just not enough. Yeah. So, as, as we begin to to wrap up, what advice would you give? Let's say someone who's just entering the profession today. What advice would you give them in order to be successful in the profession of accounting and finance? Well, something you hit on the, you know, getting experience in something that forces you to learn and use people skills, I think would help a lot. Uh, I don't know that you have to go out and get a job in the service industry to do that, although that's a great way to do it. But even if it's something as simple as like when I started trying to improve my skills, it was just like books and seminars and, and things like that. But figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are. So I think self-awareness is one of the big ones. School will prepare, when it comes to the technical stuff, I would not give them any advice on anything technical. Right. Because if you go to any, any accredited university, you're going to get a, a just fine education on the technical parts of it. And by the way, guess what? None of that crap matters anyway, because when you go to work, they're gonna send you off to training anyway to show you how they do it, show you their process, right? And you're gonna be training as you go. If you work in public accounting, you were doing training stuff all the time anyway. So it's, it's really not the technical stuff. It is the people stuff. It's problem solving. So I would do something to get some exposure to problem solving, whether it's working a job in the service industry, whether it's mentoring. Uh, one of my good friends, my first job out of college became a big brother. And he, I would hear him tell stories about stuff he would do with his little brother. And it seemed like it was this constant series of problem solving because this, this kid came from, he, his dad was not in the picture and, you know, time and money and resources were always an issue. So he was always trying to have to help this kid figure out how to find a way to do all kinds of different stuff he wanted to do. Like if he wanted to be in sports, his mom couldn't drive him because she had two jobs or whatever. And it, so I know it sounds like a, a weird way to, to get to it, but my point is when you're helping other people, some kind of a mentoring program, 
it forces you to, to think a little bit differently, put yourself in that problem solving and like helping mindset. Um, in any kind of service, when even my fraternity, which you don't, I, I don't think most people think of fraternities as service organizations, but we did a lot of service projects where we would just do volunteer stuff with different charities and different organizations. And a lot of that was figuring out, you know, how do you organize things? Again, the problem solving, the people skills, dealing with people from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Anything you can do to, to diversify your exposure to different types of people will pay off in so many ways that you'll never know until you start to see it in action. That is outstanding advice. And I, I'm just going to put a little caveat on it. If you've been in the profession 10 years and, you, and you're not a good communicator, take, it, take John's advice. He, he aimed it at you know, those who are coming into the profession. You've been in the profession. If, if you heard something in this, inter, in this conversation that we had and you went, oh, my God, that's me, go do something about it. Take, take control of it. Do something about it. Get better at it and realize it, you, it's going to hurt initially and you're going to fumble and stumble and bumble. But at some point, it changes. You just have to work on it every day. John, thank you so very much for your time, for your stories, <laughs> for your humor. Uh, she was a real witch with a capital B. I, that's gonna. That was. I caught that. That was. That's. <laughs> that was nice. And um, I'm looking forward to being at a conference in person and go. Hey, John. I know that dude. I know that dude. <laughs> <laughs> let's go let's go have lunch so um you're in north carolina be, be safe i i hope that uh i hope that this year will be the year that our, our paths will cross me too thanks for having me on i appreciate it man